Hi, my name is Kamal. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Pathology at the University of Cambridge and on the bioimaging beamline B24 at the Diamond Light Source. And I want to tell you about some of the work that I've been doing to study herpes simplex virus using an underutilized imaging technique called X-ray tomography. So herpes simplex virus is a large DNA virus that establishes lifelong infection in sensory neurons. And it tends to have variable clinical presentation. Most people are completely asymptomatic and don't know they have it. Uh, some people have mild symptoms such as cold sores and genital herpes. And fewer people still have severe inflammation such as keratitis and encephalitis. And there may even be a link between HSV and Alzheimer's. There are effective antivirals against the virus, but there is no cure and there is no approved vaccine. And the virus has applications as an oncolytic agent to treat melanoma. But the work that we do is mostly basic research. And my main focus is on understanding the assembly of the virus. So being a large DNA virus, it's actually quite complex and is composed of three different layers. First, it has a capsid, which it uses to encase the genome. And then in addition to this, it has an amorphous layer of protein called the tegument, which serves various functions. And then it has an envelope, finally, which is studded with glycoproteins, some of which are involved in cell-to-cell -cell spread, others are involved in immune evasion and other processes. And the assembly pathway itself is also quite complex and convoluted. In fact, there are two different envelopment stages. There's an envelopment stage in the cytoplasm. And at the beginning, when capsids first assemble in the nucleus, in order to get into the cytoplasm, they need to pass through the uh, nuclear envelope. But they're too large to pass through nuclear port channels. So they need to undergo an initial envelopment event. So here, they bud into the paranuclear space through the inner nuclear membrane to form a temporary virion, the envelope of which will then fuse with the outer nuclear membrane to release the capsid into the cytoplasm. Here, it will acquire the majority of its tegument and then become enveloped a second time. And then the envelope particle will end up within the lumen of a vesicle. That vesicle will then fuse with the cell surface to release the virion. And what I want to show you is that each stage of this assembly pathway can be captured by X-ray tomography. But so why do we use X-ray tomography? Well, there are certain challenges faced when visualizing viruses with conventional imaging techniques like electron microscopy. One is imaging in a 2D plane. So this reduces the coverage of the cell and can make it difficult to capture transient or short-lived events, such as the migration of capsids across the nuclear envelope. It can also make it difficult to interpret 3D geometry. So take this micrograph here, for instance. Here we have a capsid undergoing uh, envelopment, so it's being wrapped by what appears to be a tubular membrane. But this 2D image is actually compatible with more than one 3D model because it could be that this membrane isn't tubular, it's actually spherical, but only appears tubular in a 2D section. Another issue is that many conventional techniques have heavy sample processing that can introduce morphological artifacts that make the ultrastructure less reliable. So with X-ray tomography, you can produce images of cell ultrastructure that resemble electron micrographs, but achieve a resolution of 25 nanometers. Still, there is good reason to favor X-ray tomography over higher resolution EM. And the reasons for that are that we can prepare the samples by cryopreservation. And what that does is it protects the native ultrastructure, so it's a non-disruptive technique. And uh, we can also image the sample with long wavelength X-rays that, that are absorbed by ultrastructural features and can generate naturally high contrast. So it's a label-free imaging technique. You don't need to add anything like heavy metal uh, atoms. And you can also image the entire depth of the cell and produce a 3D image. So it can be really useful for studying the geometry of cellular compartments. So this is an example of a 2D projection an X-ray projection of a field of view. So here we can already see some ultrastructural features. You can see a cell junction here. And then these gray stripes here are internalizations of the cell surface. In the corner here, we can see part of the nucleus. And these dark spots are lipid droplets. And so what we do is we will 
collect multiple images from this field of view as we rotate the sample. So each image is collected at a different angle. And that allows us to capture information from each, um, each uh, Z plane in the field of view so that we can reconstruct an image in 3D. So what we can do is take those images, reconstruct them into a higher resolution tomogram like this one, and you can see much more information. So for instance, here in the higher resolution tomogram, we can see the ER network, but this wasn't visible when we looked at just a 2D projection. So with this imaging technique, we can study each stage of the assembly pathway. We can see capsids assembling in the nucleus. That's what these black spots are. We don't see these in uninfected cells, and they're the right width to be capsids. They're 125 nanometers in diameter. We can also see them crossing the nuclear envelope. So here, this particle is within the two leaflets of the nuclear envelope, and it actually appears to distend them on either side. And so this event is quite difficult to capture by EM because it's a short-lived event, and if you reduce the cell coverage, it makes it less likely that you'll capture it. But with tomography, because we can image the entire depth of the field of view, it makes us more likely that we'll capture a short-lived event like this so that we can study it. We can also see capsids interacting with vesicles in the cytoplasm, presumably undergoing envelopment. And finally, we can see viral particles at the cell surface. So just disregard these really high contrasting particles here. These are just gold nanoparticles that we use for processing purposes. Instead, focus on the small spots right at the cell surface. These are viral particles that have been tethered to the surface after exocytosis. So we are most interested in studying envelopment in the cytoplasm, and we believe that we've captured an envelopment event in action. So before I showed you this micrograph where you have a capsid that appears to be wrapped by a tubular membrane, this was collected by EM. With our data, we believe we've captured a similar profile. So here we have a capsid and its envelope, and this here is the carrier vesicle. And in 3D, it actually appears as though the carrier vesicle is spherical rather than tubular. And so it looks like the mechanism is that the capsid buds into a, pair, into a spherical membrane rather than is wrapped around a tubular one, wrapped by a tubular one. So this is a useful tool to study the mechanism behind envelopment. And that's something that we plan to do moving forward. But now I wanna tell you about a second project that we're doing to understand how the virus remodels cellular compartments during infection. And this was largely based on work done by Dr. Katerina Scherer, who is a postdoctoral scientist at the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Cambridge. And what she has done is she infected skin fibroblasts with a recombinant of HSV1 called the timestamp virus. And the timestamp virus allows you to distinguish between four different stages of infection based on the expression of fluorescently tagged early and late viral proteins. So we wanted to see what changes we could see with x-ray tomography. So we designed a similar study where we used x-ray tomography instead of fluorescent microscopy. And we used the timestamp virus, but we chose to work on a different cell line, a model cell line that has been used to study HSV infection called U2OS cells. And that was because we wanted to see if some of the changes were consistent with what have been previously observed in HFFs, in skin fibroblasts. So what we do is we seed the cells onto carbon grids, and then we infect them with the timestamp virus. And then nine hours later, we plunge the grid into liquid ethane that's cooled to about minus 70 degrees. And that allows us to cryopreserve the ultrastructure. Thereafter, all imaging is done under liquid nitrogen. So the first thing we do is we load the grid onto a wide field microscope and identify cells of interest that are early or late stages of infection. And then we load the same grid onto the x-ray microscope and find those same regions of interest and then resolve the cellular compartments by tomography. And so one of the most striking changes that we observed was in the abundance of vesicles. We saw that they tended to increase as the infection progressed. And that was interesting because that is consistent with what has been observed for HFFs. And there are multiple possible reasons for this. One is that the Golgi complex is known to fragment during infection. And uh, another is that early endosomes and lysosomes 
uh, tend to crowd at the assembly compartment during infection. And these are interesting because both the Golgi membranes and the early endosome membranes have been implicated in envelopment. So this information all relates back to viral assembly. Another overt difference that we observed was for the mitochondria. So what we've seen is that mitochondria are quite heterogeneous in shape in uninfected cells. So they can be spherical, short, curved, long, unbranched, branched, many different shapes. But what has previously been shown in HFFs is that even if they start off quite heterogeneous, they become consistently elongated uh, as the infection progresses. And we saw something similar. We saw that the mitochondria were quite heterogeneous in shape in uninfected cells, and then they became very elongated, even as early as early stages of infection. And something new that we were able to resolve with this imaging technique is that not only do the mitochondria become increasingly elongated, but they also become branched. You can see here and here. And that was interesting to us because we weren't sure what the mechanism was behind the branching, because it could be that new arms are developing on existing mitochondria, or that existing mitochondria are actually fusing together to form branches. And something that we saw in some late infected cells was that all the mitochondria had fused together into a single network. So that suggested to us that branching, one mechanism behind branching is the fusion of existing mitochondria. So all of this is interesting because mitochondria could have several roles during infection one of which could be coping with a change in the energy demand of an infected cell, or mitochondria are also known to elicit an antiviral response during infection. So the main findings of our study have been that we can identify HSV particles by X-ray tomography and their assembly intermediates. And we are able to study remodeling of cellular compartments during infection and compare them with other cell types that have been imaged with other techniques. And what we see is that the most striking changes were in the abundance of vesicles that increased during infection and that mitochondria became consistently elongated and branched. And all of this relates to the assembly of the virus or the cellular response to infection. So X-ray tomography is a valuable tool to study ultrastructure at a sufficiently high resolution in a near native state. So part of our ongoing work will be to visualize viruses by correlative imaging. So here we have captured fluorescence on a super resolution microscope called a structured illumination microscope that's cryocompatible. And that allows us to distinguish between unenveloped capsids and enveloped particles. And yes, yeah, so we're hoping that with this, we'll be able to study more envelopment events and capture more envelopment intermediates. And that, so this is something that we hope to do moving forward to help elucidate the mechanism behind wrapping, behind envelopment of viral particles. As usual, there's always too many people to thank. I want to thank all the members of the Colin Crump group, the Stephen Graham group, and Maria Harkialakis group. And I want to extend a special thanks to Elias and Mohammed, who offered a great deal of technical support for this project. And you can follow all of us on Twitter if you're interested in our work and want to learn more about what we do. You can follow the Beamline at b 24 Light. You can follow Stephen at Atomic Virology. And you can follow me at KL Nahas if you're interested in getting in touch with me about the work that we do. So, thank you.